Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. And when you have it, just simply say amen. Now it's talking about Jesus. It says, now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal one on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? But notice what Jesus said. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? He said, of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Come on, somebody. How I many? That's powerful. Look at someone and tell them you have great value. He said, therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, notice here, and it was restored as whole as the other. This morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of winning with a withered hand. Winning with a withered hand. Give your neighbor a high five, tell him it's going to be good this morning. And you may be seated. Winning with a withered hand. In the 1990s, some of you who liked baseball might remember a good, great, actually a great major leaguer by the name of Jim Abbott. Jim Abbott was a successful, very successful pitcher with a number of teams. He was drafted by the Anaheim Angels and he later went on to play for the New York Yankees. In his career as a pitcher, he had 108 wins with an ERA of four, which basically say, says that Jim Abbott was a good pitcher and he was tough to hit. Somehow, Jim always found himself on the starting rotation of a major league team. In fact, Jim Abbott never spent any time in the minor leagues. He came straight out of college into the major leagues, never got demoted to the minor leagues because he always found a place on a starting rotation with a contending major league team. Now, a lot of you might say, well, what's the big deal? There's a lot of pitchers in the major leagues with a with the 4.0 ERA and 100 wins. What's the big deal about Jim Abbott? Listen, what makes Jim Abbott truly special is not only did he play on the most important position in baseball, not only did he play that position well, but Jim Abbott was born with only one hand. And some of you remember when he'd get on that mound, he'd put that glove on that clubbed hand, right? He's actually was left-handed. He put that glove on that club hand and he'd throw that ball with power. In fact, one time I saw him so quickly that he, he threw that ball right down the middle and the batter hit that ball right at him. He switched the glove to his good hand and caught the ball. Come on, somebody. Jim Abbott is quoted as saying, find something you love and go for it and do it with all your heart. When asked why he had been so successful at the most difficult game there is to play, he said, I worked very hard. He said, I felt I could play the game. He said, but the only thing that could stop me was myself. How many caught that? The only thing that could stop me was myself. See, for Jim Abbott, watch this, it wasn't a matter of what was happening on the outside of his life. It's a matter of what was happening on the inside of his life. And I guess that's the word for us this morning when we talk about healing how many know the only thing that can really stop us is ourself? You see, this morning I want to talk to you about this man with a withered hand because whether we admit it or not, every one of us knows what it is to be born with a bad hand. Come on, somebody. Look at your hands this morning. Now, your bad hand might not be physical, but how many know sometimes our bad hands are spiritual? Sometimes we grow up saying, why was I born in this family? Talk to me, somebody. Come on, help me preach this morning. Man, I can't stand my parents. They're always fighting. They're always arguing. Come on, somebody. One's always in and out of the house. Sometimes we grow up thinking, why was I born with this bad hand? Whether we admit it or not, every one of us has had to deal with a bad hand within our life. Might not have been a physical disability, but possibly it was emotional or a spiritual disability. And many of us here this morning, we can relate because we know what it is to be born into a struggle. Am I in the right church this morning? Look at these statistics about family. 
I looked up some statistics about family and I, I came across these. It says between 1950 and 1980, the number of children involved in divorce and annulment rose 175%. This might be true for some of us. From 1970 to 1994, the number of divorced adults quadrupled, making divorced persons the fastest growing marital status category in the United States. This is the one that gripped me, and this is the one that I, I, I believe reigns true in the city of San Diego, is that 40% of children growing up in America are being raised without a father. And the number of single parents has tripled since 1980. Notice here, compared to children whose family was disrupted by death, children of divorce are four times more likely to report problems with friends and peers. In other words, children of divorce can't get along with nobody. Affecting personal educational achievement, personal career path, and personal confidence. I don't know about you, but I know what it is to grow up in a broken family. In fact, my family got divorced in, my parents got divorced in 1986. I fall right in the middle of this statistic. So whether we admit it or not, all of us have been affected by these types of hurts. These types of hurts and these types of pains hurt us deep down. You might look good on the outside, but how many know many times, regardless of how you look on the outside, we're still dealing with pain on the inside. Is anybody with me this morning? And that's why when the calling of God goes out, that's why when we call out the calling of God in your life, that's why when you come to church and you hear the call of God and you hear the bell ringing and you hear God saying, listen, I want to take you further. I want to take you higher. I want to take you to another dimensional dimension. That's why some people begin to shrink back in the presence of the Lord. We talk to you about, about answering the call to uh, to answering the call to love you say I can't be loved I can't love because I, I've been hurt and I've been hurt in love how many know what it is to be hurt in love we, we call you to giving you say I, I can't give pastor because I've been burned before I've been taken advantage of how many knows what it is to be taken advantage of see some of you not saying nothing to me because you're, you're scared you're scared see how the devil's fighting you he doesn't want you to get this word inside of you you can't give because see, I've been taken advantage of. We call you to discipleship and you say, no, I can't, I can't be discipled because I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't know what commitment is. Or I can't be a leader because someone always called me dumb or someone failed me in the past. But I came to tell you that the enemy is a liar. God wants to heal you. God doesn't want you to shrink back any further. I want you to look at someone you're sitting next to you and tell, you, tell them, don't shrink back anymore. Listen, in my many years of doing ministry, I want to tell you, I've seen many win with a withered hand. I've seen many in this church and in this ministry who were counted out, counted for nothing, marginalized. People said they'd never do it. People said their marriage would never make it. People said their kids would never get saved. People said they'd never get blessed financially. People said they'd never preach the gospel. People said they could never be a leader. I've seen how God has been able to straighten out that withered hand. I've seen how God's been able to raise him up to defy the odds. Come on, help me preach this morning. I came to tell you this morning, regardless of what's going on on the inside of you, you can defy the odds this morning you could be a Jim Abbott you don't have to let that disability hinder you any longer you can rise above the challenge you can rise above the struggle come on and help me preach today somebody Jesus can straighten out that withered hand this morning see I believe that Jesus can straighten some things out within our life God straightened it out for others but I've also seen how Sometimes, listen, hear me and hear me very clearly. Sometimes when the challenge is going out, that instead of people reaching out for God, they shrink back. They let their complexes get the best of them. I'll tell you, man, I, I, I got a good looking church. Can I just stop? Can I talk to you? This is a good looking church. Tell you, but you're good looking. You all know how to dress. Y'all some dressers up in here. You got some nice suits on, some nice ties. Ladies, nice dresses. Your hair's all did. Come on, somebody. 
different colors. Come on, I don't see no gray. I don't see no roots up in here. Talk to me. So you got some nice shoes on, brothers. Your ni- shoes are nice and shiny. Sister, you got some nice shoes on there. Come on, somebody. You're looking good. You got a nice looking Bible. You got all the latest technology. You drive a nice car. You live in a decent house. You got a decent job. When it's time to give, you got money coming out of your pocket. I seen you at the Padres game. I seen you at the Chargers game. Come on, somebody. I seen you at World Conference lifting up your hand. You look good on the outside. But some of you are still hurting on the inside. And Jesus doesn't want you to shrink back any longer. Can I hear an amen? I believe that this is the year where you begin to break spiritual walls and break spiritual barriers. Come on and help me this morning. This is your year. You're coming out of the pit. You're coming out of the trial. You're coming out of the prison of fear. Come on, somebody. This is your time. Tell your neighbor, don't you dare shrink back. There's just two things I want to share with you this morning. Number one. And I believe I won't get to this message, but I'll preach the rest of it next week. Number one is that hurt hinders our hand. Hurt hinders our hand. Some of you are here right now, but you're hurt. Don't say nothing to me. Don't say amen. You don't want to admit it. That's all right. But the reason you can't step out is because hurt has hindered your hand. See, I want to tell you, where did did Jesus find this man with the withered hand? He didn't find him in the street. Mm. He didn't find him in the marketplace. Where did he find him? Jesus found him in the synagogue. For modern day times, it means that Jesus found him in the church house. Hey, hey, hey. I feel like preaching this morning. That's why I didn't wear my tie. (laughs) Jesus found them singing on the worship team. Found them sitting in the first and second and third row this morning. Jesus found them ushering. Jesus found them in the men's home, in the women's home. Jesus found them over there in the sound booth. That's right, you're in the sound booth. Jesus found them in the parking lots. Jesus found them in the cell group. Jesus found them in the family life flow. But let me tell you the good news. If you're in the house of the Lord, you're in the right place this morning. Because the house of the Lord is a hospital for those that are hurt. Tell your neighbor, you're in the right place. It says, behold, there was a man with a withered hand right there in the synagogue. If you have a withered hand this morning... I don't care what you're doing. You're in the right place. Now, why do Christians walk hurt, though? I'll tell you why. Because nobody has told them that there's a Savior who can heal them internally. No one has told them that there's a Savior that can heal them internally. Listen, a lot of times we believe for physical healing, but we don't believe for spiritual healing. There are two reasons that Jesus came. The first reason I shared last week is to go to the cross for our salvation. How many of you know, just like that song said, there's, there's power in the blood. How many are grateful for the blood of Jesus in your life? Are you grateful for that? Can you go ahead and praise him? You're grateful for the blood. Why? Because the blood breaks the chains. How many of there's no sin that's too great for God to forgive? That if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, you've been forgiven. Come on, somebody. Jesus doesn't see the sin. He sees the blood. He says, and when I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. You'll you'll, you'll miss judgment. Can I hear an amen? If you're here this morning and you've been in sin, you can receive the blood of Jesus this morning. And you'll be given a brand new start. He can break the chains of addiction. He could break the chains of bondage. Come on, somebody. He could deliver you out of that pit this morning. Jesus can came to save us but I want you to also know that Jesus not only came to save us but this is the part we've got to understand that Jesus came to heal us he came to heal us 
I, I was blown away. Go there with me. Look at Luke. Look at Luke chapter 4, Jesus' mission statement. Luke 4, 18. We all know the scripture very well, but really take a look at this. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news of the poor. But notice here, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind. Watch this. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Listen, I'm no mathematician. But, my, but by my, cal my simple calculations, 75% of Jesus' mission is to bring healing to people's life. Come on, somebody. Get with me. I'm no mathematician, but majority of Jesus' mission was not only to come and to die on the cross for our salvation. How many Christians are running around the church that's happy to be saved, but you're still hurt? Oh, my God. You don't want to admit it this morning. You're happy. I'm, I'm saved, Pastor. I'm going to heaven. Yeah, but you're still medicating yourself. And you're still trying to bury the pain. And you're still going from relationship to relationship to relationship. Come on, somebody. And you're still behaving like the world. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're going to heaven. Yes, the grace of God. It's hard to snatch you from the hand of God. But you're still living like the world because you're saved, but you're not healed. Oh, come on. Say something to me. Come on. Even if, if you say, see, those of you that are clapping are healed. But some of you ain't clapping because you're like, man, he's been reading my mail. I don't need to re read your mail because I know what it is to be a Christian who's saved but hurting inside. I know what it is to be a Christian that's going to heaven, shouting victory on the outside, singing all the songs, putting up the front. All my posts on Facebook are positive posts. But deep down inside, people have been wounded. They've been in a spiritual battle. They've been in a spiritual war. The devil's been trying to kill you. Doesn't want your family to make it. Doesn't want your marriage to make it. Doesn't want your kids to make it. Has released an all-out attack on your life. And instead of you standing strong, you're wounded inside. But I came to tell you there's power and healing in Calvary. And Jesus wants to heal your life. Why do so many people... Walk wounded in the house of the Lord because we teach them about salvation, but we don't teach them that Jesus can heal the inside of a man. He can heal the inside of a woman. Say amen. We need to teach them about inner healing. We need to teach them that the finished work of Calvary is not only so we can go to heaven, but that we can have life. Watch this. And life more abundantly while we are here on earth. You shouldn't have a frown on your face. You shouldn't be depressed. You shouldn't be struggling. Because when you really understand what Jesus did on the cross, you're going to be filled with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. There's going to be a skip in your step. There's going to be a glide in your stride. You're going to know how to give God praise in the dark hour. You know how you... Oh, come on, somebody. Tell your neighbor, God's that good. He wants to heal our life. The work at Calvary was finished. But why do Christians walk hurt? Because they haven't receive the full work of Calvary by faith. The work's done. But you have to receive it into your heart by faith. You have to, by faith, say, Jesus not only died for my salvation, but he died for my inner healing as well. You have to know what the word says about your healing. Psalms 103, this is a powerful Powerful scripture. Some of you know it. This is one of my most favorite scriptures in the Bible. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. How many know a healed man is a praising man? How many know a healed woman is a praising woman? David wrote, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Look at this. And forget 
not all of his benefits. <laughs> What am I telling you is that some Christians can't praise God because you have not yet received all of his benefits. You've only received some of his benefits. Come on, somebody. I'm, that's going to change in your life this morning because you're going to learn how to bring it all in. Can I hear an amen? You're not just going to bring in the salvation. You're not just going to bring in the deliverance. You're going to bring in the healing as well. He says, who forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Look at this. Look at this. Who satisf satisfies your mouth with good things. That means that what comes out of your mouth are good things. Come on, somebody. No complaining. No gossiping. No negativity. Talk to me. You can tell the condition of a man or a woman's heart based on what comes out of their mouth. I'm just trying to help you this morning. The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when you've been healed in your heart, you've been healed in your soul, you're going to know how to praise God. You're going to know how to walk, talk by faith. You're going to know how to speak those things that are not as if though they were. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. Look at this. Look at this. This is the key. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. How many older people like me would like to feel young again? <laughs> Come on, talk to me now. I'm 42 now, baby. I'm getting up there. I'm sorry. I'm starting to marry my disciples here. I'm getting old. Talk to me. Pretty soon I'll be a grandparent like Miller. He's getting old too. But how many older people would like to have that young spirit? Oh, uh, come on, somebody. I know there's a lot of young people here like, oh, pastor, how cute. No, no, you, you, you're going you're gonna to make your way. You, that door is going to be open to you soon. You'll be where we are real soon. Don't judge. Don't try to act like, oh, how cute. I'm never going to lose a fire. Okay, all right, all right, all right. We'll, all right, we'll pray for you when you get there. Come on, let my 40 plus people say amen. How many of you would like to have that fire you had when you were in the youth ministry? How many would like to have that fire when you were, come on, just got saved? Can I hear an amen? Then you got to let the Lord heal you. And he'll begin to bring in the strength of your youth. You'll be like a young lion. You'll be like a young tiger. Come on, somebody. God wants to heal our life. Tell your neighbor, it's time to heal. See, we need to know the benefits of healing. And this brings me to the second thing and the last thing for this morning is that not only does hurt hinder our hand, but the second thing we see here in the scripture is that the heartbeat of heaven is to heal. Do you see that? Someone say perspective. This is what I think a lot of us need in this first service is we need an adjustment on our perspective. What did Jesus say in, in the story in Matthew 12? He said, which one of you having... A sheep, right? And that sheep falls into a ditch or gets injured or gets lost, would not leave the others and go find it no matter what day it is. Talk to me, someone. He said, how much more valuable is a man? See, what Jesus was showing us here is that heaven is compassionate to the hurting. You hear that? That heaven has compassion. That heaven cares. That Jesus cares. Sometimes we're hurt because we don't feel like anybody cares. And yeah, maybe your parents don't care anymore. They don't call you. They don't, they don't treat you that well. Maybe you have family members that no longer care. But regardless of the people that don't care, I came to tell you, heaven cares. We can give God better praise than that. Come on, we can give God better praise. Heaven cares. Jesus cares. God cares for the pain. God cares for the hurt. God cares about the struggle. Listen, people have walked out of your life in your time of struggle, but that's when God walks in. It says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Come on, he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Why? Because heaven cares about the hurting. The heartbeat of heaven is not only to care for your hurt, but to heal your hurt. Jesus, in his ministry, was compassionate and unapologetic in healing the sick. In fact, if you read in verse 15 of chapter 12, you can do it on your own. But it says Jesus, the, the, the Pharisees got mad because religious people are uncompassionate people. Come on, somebody. 
And the Pharisees got mad. Tell your neighbor, the Pharisees got mad. And they plotted to kill him. But Jesus, watch what he did. He knew that was going to happen. So he withdrew, the scripture says, from where he was. And the people followed him. And notice here, he healed all of them. <laughs> he didn't just heal some of them. He didn't just heal a few of them. Say this with me. Say, he healed all of them. How many want to heal? Then the first thing that you need to understand is that healing is not for some. Sometimes we come to church and someone gets healed and like, man, God loves them more than me. Man, I'm under a curse. We talked about it last week. How I many we heard last week? Man, my life is cursed. Nothing good ever happens. See, the, see how the devil wants to keep you hurt? God loves them more than me. That's why they're healed. That's why they're shouting for joy. That's why their marriage is doing good. You don't know how their marriage is doing. That's how they act here, but you don't know how their marriage is really doing. Their money's good. You don't know that. God loves them more than me. God doesn't come to heal some. Jesus doesn't come to heal some. How many know the scripture says Jesus came to heal all? I'm trying to help somebody. Come on, I'm trying to help someone that's been hurt. I'm, I'm trying to help someone that has a withered hand. I, I'm trying to help someone that has a secret issue in your life. The leper healed, the rich man healed, the poor man healed. Every single one of them is healed. Understand me when I tell you that healing is not for few. Healing is not for the elite. Healing is not for the people that have been in church the longest. Healing is for everybody. If you're here this morning, you're in the presence of a healer. You're in the presence of a God that says nothing is too hard for me. I can touch you. I can pour out my oil from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. I can lift up your spirit. You're defeated. You don't got to walk out defeated. You can walk out with the victory because I'm Jehovah Rapha. I'm the God that healed thee. I am able by my stripes. You are healed. He's able to heal. Write that down. He's able to heal. That scripture tells us that he's healed, able to heal, and nothing is too hard for him to heal. But the second thing is not only is he able to heal, but this is the key. Man, some of you are gonna, never going to be the same after this message. Watch. Not only is he able to heal, but he's willing to heal. He's willing to heal. You know why so many Christians, so many people never receive their healing? You know the number one reason why people fail to receive their healing? The spirit of rejection the spirit of abandonment, and the spirit of doubt. So many people do not receive their healing because they've been so rejected in life. They feel that God doesn't love them enough to heal them. They've been abandoned by their natural parents. So they feel that now their heavenly father will abandon them in their biggest time of need. And what we say is this, they didn't receive their healing because they didn't have faith and they doubted the power of God. Understand me, it's not that they doubt the power of God, they doubt the character of God. This is too strong for some of you. Because you know God's power is real because he delivered you from alcohol, drugs, those issues instantly, you never went back to them. But why don't we walk in healing? Because we think that God doesn't love us enough or he's not willing enough to bring us to that place that we deep down desire to be. Is this heavy? We've been so rejected. We've been so abandoned. We've been so neglected in the natural realm. 
that we feel that God is going to neglect us and abandon us, abandon us in the spiritual realm. And I'll tell you that I know what it feels like to be like that. I know what it feels like to be in that very same position within my life. I love the, the story of the leper. You know, this story is powerful and personal to me. Because when it comes to receiving healing in my life, even as a leader, even as a pastor, I've had to learn. And I can tell you that in my life, I've, been, I've had many struggles in my life, many struggles. I've been through many things. Abandonment, hurt, rejection, pain. I've had to fight to get to the place where I am today. It's been an uphill battle. I wish I could tell you I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I wasn't. I know what it is to come out of brokenness. I know what it is to rise out of the ashes of my life and get to a place where I can help others. But I've had to fight. I've had to scrap. I've had to battle. Many of you know my story. But the cherry on top of that story is when my daughter got sick. When my daughter got sick, I tell you, I really got into a dark place. And I really prayed about sharing this because I don't like to share everything. But I really got into a dark place. And I got into this place where I felt like God didn't love me. That God didn't love me. And then somehow the trials that I was facing, I felt so unloved by God. I felt so abandoned by God. God, why me? Why our family? We're your servants. We're trying to help people. And we're going through these types of trials do you love me? This is too strong. And it got real dark for me. Then Satan came in. And he started telling me, God's not real. God's not real. God's not real. You're preaching, you're preaching falsehood. You wasted your life. Look at you. You wasted your life mocking me. Every time I'd go to that hospital in the morning, mocking me, mocking me. Look at all these people that have said, look at all these people that are going, mocking me, making fun of me, mocking me, making me feel like, I, I, like, like I, my life was a waste, like I'd given myself to something false. I'm going to tell you, it got very crazy. But it was right there one day when I was, wow, just the best thing you can do. I'm driving to the hospital early in the morning, and I'm sitting, look at where I'm sitting. I'm sitting under the word of God. There's preaching going on and I'm sitting under the word of God and I kept myself under the word of God and this great tremendous preacher, I won't mention his name, he began to speak about the leper and he began to talk about how his daughter was also sick and she was in and out of the hospital for years and didn't know how she was going to get better and how he began to share about the leper and how the leper came to Jesus and watch what he said to him. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. In that one statement, the leper was saying, nothing is impossible for you when it boils down to your will. If it wasn't his will, I won't share this with you. But the leper is saying, listen, when it boils down to your will and you desire to do a thing, nothing can stop you from doing that thing. Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. What was Jesus' response to that leper? He looked at that leper. He said, I am willing. And that leper was instantly healed on the spot. Come on, Victory Outreach San Diego. Understand the heartbeat of heaven is to heal you. The Lord is willing to heal you. Nothing is impossible for God. He's just looking for someone that will call on his power and say, God, no hurt, no pain, no sickness, no problems in my body. is too difficult for you to heal. My daughter is here this morning. She is healed. She's getting better. She's getting stronger every single day single day we serve a God that has the will 
He has the will to heal you. No matter what you're going through this morning, nothing is too hard for God in terms of healing your wounds. It's all available to you. It's all available to you. If you're gonna, if you're gonna rise to that place that God has called you to go, and you're gonna be that person that God has called you to be. How many want to be that person God's called them to be? How many feel that you're going to be one of those leaders? Come on, how many feel like you're going to be one of those disciples, that you're going to be one of those powerful servants of God? Wave at me, wave at me, wave at me, wave at me. You must go through the door that we all had to go through. You must go through the door of healing. There's preachers in this room that aren't preaching. There's leaders in this room that aren't yet leading. There's marriages in this room that are not doing what God has called them to do. And then there's a whole group of people here that you say, Pastor, man, I, I know what it is to be on fire for God. Watch this. But I was hurt. Let me put it this way. I was hit. As I close out this message this morning, let me tell you this, that the Bible says that when the man stretched out his hand, the Bible says his hand, watch this, watch, was restored. Say this with me, say restored. Say it stronger, say restored. One more time, say restored. What does that tell me? Lean in. Some of you are catching it. What does that tell me? That tells me that his hand was not always shriveled. You can't restore something that was never right in the first place. There was a time when he walked with both hands fully functional. Some commentators say that he was a stonemason by trade. And I don't know if a brick fell on his hand and shrunk him back, but something happened in his life that messed up his hand. And there's some of us here this morning that the reason we're hurt is because something messed you up. It wasn't your fault, it just happened. And now you hear messages about commitment and going to another level and you can't go because something's hurt. Let me put it this way. You've been injured in the house of the Lord. You've been injured in life. And instead of stretching out, you've shrunk back. But all you need to do this morning is to understand, please catch this, understand that it is within your Father's will to heal you. The healing is here. The healing is here. But all you need to do is to come out of where you are. To come out from amongst the crowd and say, Lord, if you are willing to heal me, I know you can. Lift up your hand if you say this message was for me this morning. Just lift up your hands. I'll begin to worship him all over this place. Come on, begin to worship him all over this place. I'm only going to...